This is NBC News. Russ Ward reporting from Washington, where Secretary of State Dean Rusk is about to hold a news conference, his first meeting with newsmen since returning from Saigon and the Far East earlier this week. Reporters are gathered in the International Conference Room at State Department headquarters here in Washington. Mr. Rusk is due momentarily. The Secretary and roving Ambassador W. Averill Harriman conferred with President Johnson late yesterday afternoon on their talks with government and military leaders in Saigon. Mr. Rusk flew to the Vietnamese capital from New Delhi, where he attended the funeral of the late Prime Minister Shastri. Ambassador Harriman was in Saigon as the last major step on a worldwide peace mission that took him to nearly two dozen countries. The U.S. bombing moratorium over North Vietnam is now in its 28th day. Secretary Rusk is expected to be questioned about the suspension and bombing and how long it may continue. There are reports here in Washington, Britain and other allied countries are urging the United States to continue the moratorium for an indefinite period. This also may receive further clarification. Secretary Rusk has now entered the international conference room and is taking his place at the large U-shaped table, the conference about to get underway. Good morning, gentlemen. Ambassador Harriman and I have now reported to the president on our recent journeys abroad. Yesterday, at Independence, Missouri, President Johnson summarized where we are with respect to the possibilities of peace in Vietnam. You are familiar with the intensive effort which has been made since Christmas to probe the prospects for peace. We have been in touch again with the governments of the world and with many of them through special emissaries. There has been an overwhelmingly favorable response to these efforts, except from those who could, in fact, sit down and make peace. The diplomatic efforts of the past four weeks have not caught the other side by surprise. In April, President Johnson at Baltimore called for unconditional discussions. In May, there was a cessation of bombing, which ended after a harsh rejection by the other side of any serious move toward peace. Over the months, the President and I have discussed the elements of a reasonable peace which were summarized at year's end by the so-called 14 points. For months on end, both publicly and privately, it was indicated to the other side that the bombing could be stopped as a step toward peace. And every possible effort was made to ascertain what the response might be. But nothing was forthcoming from Hanoi on that subject. Nevertheless, a number of governments, including communist governments, insisted that diplomacy could play a more effective role and the prospect for peace would be improved if, in fact, the bombing were suspended. The Christmas ceasefire was therefore extended as far as the bombing was concerned. Until now, the suspension is in its 29th day. The question posed to the other side, are you interested in peace, is the same question which has been posed for months and indeed years by all available means. We've been waiting for some word from Hanoi that goes beyond bitter invective or charges that talk of peace is a trick or a deceit or a swindle. We have been listening for sounds other than the sounds of bombs and grenades and mortars in South Vietnam. I regret that I cannot report to you any positive and encouraging response to the hopes of the overwhelming majority of mankind. These past 29 days, 
against the background of all that has gone before, have provided every opportunity for the authorities in Hanoi to make some serious response. The steady purpose of the United States in Southeast Asia and elsewhere is to do our full part in building a decent world order at peace under law in which small as well as large nations can live in safety and free from molestation. We must continue on this course with patience and persistence. But as President Johnson put it yesterday, the door of peace must be kept wide open for all who wish to avoid the scourge of war. But the door of aggression must be closed and bolted if man himself is to survive. So we shall do what we can to bring peace to Southeast Asia and shall do what we must to prevent the success of a cruel aggression. Mr. Secretary, you say in your statement that Hanoi in the past 29 days has been given every opportunity to make some favorable response. Uh, <clears throat> does this mean that the administration in its decision-making process is now at the point where it must decide in just what form to take the other hard steps which the President warned December 9th would be taken if the Communists failed to respond favorably to all of the long efforts? In other words, are you ready to resume the bombing? Well, I think you would not uh, want me, or perhaps I should say you would not expect me, uh, to go into uh, questions about uh, future military policy or military action. I think the President uh, yesterday uh, made the position very clear and he has made clear on many occasions uh, that our commitment to the safety and the freedom of South Vietnam is deep uh, and that we shall do what is necessary to achieve the elementary objectives which we in the South Vietnamese share. Secretary, <clears throat> the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations indicated yesterday that <clears throat> a concrete proposal uh, which would uh, bring the National Liberation Front into a post-war liberation government might spur the uh, peace negotiations. What is your reaction to that, sir? Well, I think that uh, our view is that the government of South Vietnam is a matter which should be determined by the people of South Vietnam themselves. Uh, we ourselves have supported and continue to support the idea of free elections in which the South Vietnamese people can make these decisions rather than have these decisions made for them by imposition from the outside. Uh, what is needed here uh, is a proposal from Hanoi looking toward peace. The simple issue is the apparent determination of Hanoi to impose a political solution upon South Vietnam by force. If they abandon that determination, if they themselves adopt another policy, then many things could fall into line and peace could be readily established. But that's the heart of the matter. That's, that's the, the central issue. And almost all of the other aspects are incidental to that central point. Is Hanoi going to hold its hand and refrain from trying to impose a political solution on South Vietnam by force? If the answer to that question is yes, they will, then peace can be brought about very quickly. If their answer to that is no, uh, then uh, we in the South Vietnamese will have to do what is required. Mr. Mr. Secretary, sir, the group headed by Senate Majority Ma uh, Leader Mansfield warned about the dangers of the war expanding into Southeast Asia and elsewhere in Asia. What could you say about that, sir? I think that there is always a danger when an aggressor sets out to impose his will by force on someone else and uh, those of us who have commitments are resolved to meet our commitments. I cannot say that there is no danger but I would say that those dangers exist for the other side as well 
and that uh, rational men should try to bring this matter to the conference table and not try to uh, not, not allow this matter to uh, move by stages to the kind of conflict which no one uh, could reasonably desire. Secretary, you twice mentioned the fact that this is the 29th day of no bombing, uh, and you seem to have left the impression that the string might be running out on this particular line of policy. I wonder, sir, if that was uh, your intention. Well, I think I've already commented on that. I'm not going to today to get into the question of uh, uh, the future and future moves or what may be required. What we need is something serious from Hanoi pointing toward peace, and that we have not had. Sir, could you tell us uh, what is the distinction in the minds of the U.S. government officials concerned with the problem on not permitting the National Liberation Front to be a political entity at negotiations and yet saying that we would not uh, be opposed to having their views presented? The so-called National Liberation Front, which was formed in Hanoi in 1960, uh, is only a fraction of the South Vietnamese people. There are many other South Vietnamese. The overwhelming majority of the South Vietnamese people are made up of the, the Buddhists and the Catholics and the other sects and the Montagnards. The million who fled from Hanoi in 1954-55 to escape a communist regime. Uh, we feel that the South Vietnamese people as a whole uh, should have the responsibility for making the decisions about their future. Now, the President in July has indicated that um, if Hanoi is interested in peace, there should be no insuperable problem in, uh, in uh, having the views of the so-called Liberation Front uh, reflected. Uh, but uh, that does not mean that, um, uh, that uh, they are the representatives of the South Vietnamese people, uh, the overwhelming majority of whom, and there are 14 million of them, the overwhelming majority of whom want something other than what the Liberation Front has been offering. Uh, some military authority and others already believe the pause has gone too long, that it has given a military advantage to the other side. What can you tell us about the amount of uh, repairs that the North Vietnamese have made to transportation and about the infiltration of men and supplies and perhaps the arrival of additional weapons? They were, uh, of course, in the North working on repairs um, before the pa pause, working diligently to restore certain of the facilities uh, that had been uh, uh, destroyed by, by bombing. Uh, we have had reconnaissance uh, in North Vietnam over this period. We know that uh, many of the installations which were knocked out uh, remain knocked out, but we also know they've been working on repairing certain of the others. Uh, this is a matter which was taken fully into account in the decisions made with respect to the course of the last uh, month. Um, Mr. Secretary, have we requested of any other nation military assistance, and if so, what response have we had? Well, we've invited um, assistance from a good many uh, nations uh, in whatever form they themselves feel that they can, uh, they can provide. Uh, I am not able to report on specific um, <coughs> decisions taken by specific governments today, but uh, we do know that a number of governments are considering additional assistance to South Vietnam, and we're hopeful that that will become apparent in the weeks ahead. Secretary, many persons looking back uh, upon this record of negotiation since the April speech that you mentioned uh, uh, say that they see an evolution uh, in the United States position uh, toward a more conciliatory posture to, to provoke negotiations. Do you agree with that? And if so, could you tell us what you think have been the major uh, changes or evolutions in our stand? I think in uh, April, um, the president... Um, <coughs> made very clear and public uh, a point of view which he had had before, and indeed uh, which has marked the uh, efforts of the United States government for many years. The, most Im uh, the, the first important step after the decisions taken by Hanoi to move into Laos and South Vietnam, the first important step to try to find a peaceful solution in Southeast Asia was the conversation between President Kennedy and Chairman Khrushchev in Vienna in June 1961. And there they seemed to reach an agreement about Laos as an important first step. That led to the Geneva Conference and the agreement on Laos, an agreement which uh, could have provided uh, uh, a great benefit uh, to the people of Laos as well as a uh, uh, pillar of peace in Southeast Asia, 
except that Hanoi never brought themselves into compliance with it for a single day, for a single day. They left large numbers of their troops behind. They continued to use Laos as an infiltration route into South Vietnam. Nevertheless, um, from that time onward, uh, the United States government has been in touch with many governments every year, throughout the year, to explore the possibilities of peace in Southeast Asia. During the last calendar year, my staff um, advises me that I myself had more than 120 discussions personally with high officials of other governments uh, to uh, explore the possibilities of a peaceful settlement in Southeast Asia. In April, President Johnson uh, made it very clear that as far as we are concerned, the door to discussion is open, that if there's anyone there at the table, we will be there to talk to them about peace. And I think that it has been made dramatically clear in the past month that uh, if there are obstacles to peace in Southeast Asia, they are not in Washington. Uh, those obstacles are in Hanoi. Those obstacles lie with those who are determined to continue aggression in Southeast Asia. You spoke of receiving no indications from Hanoi of, of being interested in peace. Can we assume that, therefore, any reports we may have received from the Russians were negative after their uh, visit of the Soviet delegation to Hanoi, or that we have received no reports from the Russians? I would uh, not wish to embroider on what I said in terms of channels or communication. I'm simply saying that we have not received uh, the kind of response for which we were hoping um, during this period. Yes. While Australians, who are part of the British Commonwealth, are fighting the Viet Cong, I'm not aware of any uh, munitions supplied uh, by the British uh, by ship to the Viet Cong. As a matter of fact, um, free world shipping uh, to uh, North Vietnam has been very drastically reduced in the past uh, several months. Uh, we know that strategic materials are not moving into North Vietnam by ship. Indeed, many of those free world ships go in empty in order to bring out uh, fresh fruits and vegetables and other products uh, for, um, uh, for other, uh, other countries. Uh, these uh, free world ships, for the most part, are under charter to communist countries and are not fully under the control of the, flag, uh, of the countries whose flags they fly. Charges are being made in Congress to the effect that the British are providing such supplies. And the Congressional well, I, uh, record carries... carries I will have my chance uh, this next week to uh, discuss that with uh, members of the Congress, but um, uh, we have no information at all that indicates that free world ships are carrying strategic supplies in North Vietnam. I wonder if you could discuss with us, uh, on the basis of your talks with Mr. Kasigan, the status of Soviet-American relations at this time. Well, I would not wish to relate them uh, to, my, uh, to the Vice President's talk with uh, Mr. Kasigan, uh, at which I was present. Um, that was in the nature of a courtesy call, and um, we uh, reviewed, uh, as the phrase goes, uh, matters of common interest to the two countries. Um, I think that it is uh, clear that uh, the Vietnam problem has cast some shadow over relations between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, as far as we're concerned, we would be prepared to try to find ways and means to find points of agreement and get on with the uh, business of uh, normal relations uh, despite this particular problem. We would hope that the Soviet Union, as a co-chairman of the Geneva Conferences of 1954 and 1962, would take uh, its uh, responsibilities as a co-chairman seriously and do everything that it can to bring these problems of Southeast Asia to a peaceful conclusion. Uh, there are some complications, of course, um, within the communist world, which uh, uh, may make it difficult for them at particular times to move in particular ways, but um, uh, we would hope that uh, they would uh, recognize the importance of the agreements of 54 and 62 and do what they can to um, bring about peace in Southeast Asia on the basis of those two agreements. And then the back here. Mr. Secretary, there have been some reports that the North Koreans are infiltrating into South Korea, perhaps uh, in response to the South Korean commitment in Vietnam. I wonder, sir, if you could tell us how extensive this is, what sort of infiltration it is, 
and what is being done to stop it. No, I haven't seen anything new on that at all. Um, I, over the years, uh, there are occasional um, infiltrators uh, along the, um, the line in Korea, but uh, I'm not aware of uh, anything new or especially significant in that field. Specifically, no reply by the Hanoi government on the memorandum which was delivered to them by an American diplomat three weeks ago or so. I think my opening statement covers that point. Secretary, would you assess for us the recent uh, significance of the recent military takeovers in Africa, especially in Nigeria, a country which we thought would be a standard bearer of Western star democracy? There have been. Uh, events in uh, three or four African countries um, uh, which uh, seem not to be connected with each other, where special circumstances in each country have produced uh, changes in government. Uh, we uh, ourselves would uh, hope that uh, these new countries of Africa could uh, find their way onto a path of uh, substantial and constitutional and stable governments uh, which would um, make it possible for them to move for, toward economic and social development of their peoples. Um, I would not wish to comment specifically on individual countries at this point because we are studying these situations and consulting other governments about them, and uh, we'll be getting into such questions as recognition and things of that sort in due course. You're marking your fifth year in office this week. Uh, could you tell us what your most satisfying personal accomplishments have been during this period, what you're looking forward to, and uh, whether you're finding it difficult or easy to keep up the pace after five years? Well, I think the pace has been such that um, I haven't really uh, had much time to um, philosophize about the total experience. Uh, these have been years that have been uh, crowded with events, some very satisfying and some difficult and dangerous and complicated. I do believe that um, the world is moving, uh, despite the present difficulties and the present clouds on the horizon, that the world is moving uh, steadily toward, uh, toward peace. Uh, that seems uh, rather a bold statement under present circumstances, but I do believe there's a greater comprehension of the meaning of war, of a nuclear exchange, of the use of massed armies in, com in conflict. Uh, we have not yet resolved the problem of what the communist world calls, calls wars of national liberation. We have not yet uh, achieved a situation in which small as well as large countries can live securely in peace, uh, safe from outside threat or attack by subversion or the infiltration of men in arms. Uh, and that is why the situation in Southeast Asia is so very important. But I think the, uh, the general trend has been uh, toward uh, sobriety, toward prudence, and I would hope that that can continue. I think that um, one of the most important tasks in front of us um, uh, is to um, make more headway in the settlement of disputes and in getting on with the great uh, prospect of disarmament. Uh, far too many of the world's resources are uh, consigned to uh, arms and uh, based upon the uh, possibility of armed conflict. We ought somehow to free mankind from this burden. But uh, I must say that in the, in the longer range, uh, I am optimistic about uh, where people are going, where nations are going, because I think that the decent purposes of ordinary men and women all over the world are making themselves felt. Uh, but that does not overlook the fact that in the short range, we have some very difficult and dangerous problems to solve. To clarify one point on the Vietnamese situation, which has not been mentioned here today, the President, in his State of the Union message, suggested a one uh, possible course of action might be a reduction of the level of hostilities. The following day, the President did mention that there had been some reduction of the number of incidents, but said that... Uh, he was, not able, he was not able to say whether this was a re result of the peace probe or not. Could you tell us, sir, what the situation is in that regard at this stage? We have uh, watched the, uh, not only the number, but the character of incidents very closely, not only over the past several weeks, but over the past uh, years. Uh, the Viet Cong have continued to maintain a 
high level of terror and sabotage incidents. The uh, attacks by organized units, say a battalion or larger, will vary in number rather considerably from period to period. Uh, there's been some variation uh, in those in uh, recent weeks, but uh, on the whole, I think it would be um, uh, unsafe to try to draw any political conclusions from the pattern. These patterns change, and um, we see no, no general trend. There's every indication that, um, that the other side is going to intensify its activity uh, after this Tet period. General Uthant advanced uh, what sounds like a rather interesting theory yesterday to the effect that uh, the present Chinese communist leadership could be compared to a person that has suffered a nervous breakdown and therefore should be treated with extra kindness in order to restore it to uh, complete health. What do you think of this as a guide uh, for the United States in its attitude toward Red China? Well, there are two sides to that problem. Uh, as far as we're concerned, in all of our talks with uh, the authorities in Peiping, we've had more than 125 of them now, uh, they start out saying that there's nothing to discuss unless you're prepared to surrender Formosa. And when we say we can't surrender 11 million people against their will, then the conversation gets rather stilted. So um, I uh, think that those who are concerned about... Uh, improving relations with Pei Ping must face that question. What are you going to do about these 11 million people on Formosa? Those who are prepared to surrender them uh, might, uh, might uh, do business with uh, Pei Ping. But uh, we may be in a special position there because we have an alliance with, with, with uh, the Republic of China and have forces in Formosa. Uh, but um, that is the beginning and the end uh, of any serious discussions with Pei Ping as far as our own relations with them are concerned. Secretary, just to clarify. NBC News has just presented the main portion of a news conference by Secretary of State Dean Rust, brought to you live from the International Conference Room at State Department headquarters. Mr. Rust said we have been in touch with the governments of the world on peace in Vietnam. We have met with encouragement from all except those who could sit down and talk peace. A number of governments, he said, including communist governments, have insisted uh, that diplomatic efforts for peace would be enhanced if bombing of North Vietnam were suspended. The bombing has been in suspension for 29 days, said the Secretary, but there has been no serious response from North Vietnam toward peace. Secretary Rust declined to say if and when the bombing of North Vietnam might resume. He said the simple issue uh, is the commitment of North Vietnam to impose a political solution on South Vietnam by force. If Hanoi would give up that commitment, said the Secretary, peace could be forthcoming promptly. The first important step toward peace in Southeast Asia came in 1961, he said, in a meeting between President Kennedy and Chairman Khrushchev. Hanoi never accepted the decisions made at that meeting on Laos and has continued its aggression. Said the Secretary, we shall do what we can to bring peace and do what we must to prevent the success of aggression. This is Russ Ward, NBC News, Washington. This is the NBC Radio Network.